topic, as you see, uh, I select to uh, discuss one very interesting, at least for me, topic regarding how to select and prepare our domain model for uh, our applications. There are different approaches for this. And uh, starting uh, with uh, this uh, discussion, I want uh, quickly to thanks uh, for this to the author that I used for most, almost all the materials that I use in my presentation. You can see it, Vladimir Horikov. He has many uh, plural site courses and uh, articles, blogs, whatever. Most of the ideas I take from here. And uh, if you want after that, and you are interested in um, these topics, you can go and uh, check in very uh, details uh, what is the implementation and what are uh, all these uh, shared ideas for my current presentation. So uh, let's start with uh, our not very big presentation. Uh, when we start to talk about uh, domain models, uh, usually we have uh, two options for domain models. And uh, one is to have data. Data is um, some classes with public getter and setters. And we have operation that use this data. It is uh, very typical for most type of applications. Usually uh, operations uh, keep some business logic uh, that is uh, performed over our data. So um, as uh, you already use such approach, this kind of model is so-called anemic domain model. Uh, I don't try to set is it is bad or good. We can uh, discuss this in a few more model slides and decide uh, for each of uh, two options for domain models, anemic one and rich one, they are applicable cases when they can be used or also we can combine these models in one hour application. But in general, when we have only data and uh, operations which are situated in some other uh, place, we have this anemic model. Uh, what we can do to uh, change these options? Usually we have a uh, few uh, approaches to skip from this anemic domain model. Uh, first of all, uh, when we use usually entities, we need to have one additional layer of abstraction like DTOs or so-called data transfer objects which usually can be different from the structure of our uh, domain entities. They can keep, for instance, more properties, can keep some additional methods and so on. And the main uh, actor in our uh, scene actually is so-called value objects, which are uh, main building blocks and can help us on the path to uh, skip this simple domain model and to put it in a rich one. And the idea actually is to get all the logic that is related to our entities and to transfer it from uh, these separate uh, operations, which are in some other assembly or some other layer of our application and to put all of the business logic in our domain one. So uh, why it is uh, useful for us? Uh, there are a few reasons for this. One of these is, uh, as uh, this slide showed, discoverability. Usually this means that uh, we keep our data not in uh, separate uh, layers or tiers. Uh, we have our entity objects and our operation on them on the same place. So from development perspective, it is easier to find uh, entities and what is happened within the, with these entities, which transformations are applied on them on one place, one object, which keeps whole business logic inside it. Uh, 
from uh, other perspective, it is not so uh, difficult to make code duplications. What I mean when we have separate uh, layer for services that do some operation on our entities, it is not hard to implement uh, some operation more than once, at least when we work in a team. Uh, some developer can, uh, can put some uh, logic in some method and part of this logic can be duplicated in some other method. So uh, this duplication of logic is something that is uh, not good for keeping our model in a good state. And uh, the third one is, uh, as it's uh, described here, lack of encapsulation which actually is not exactly to hide uh, some external structures and data in our models, but the main idea behind this encapsulation is actually to protect the integrity of the entity. Uh, what I have in mind is to uh, keep this entity in a state that is not against some business rules. Never mind which uh, operations are applied on this entity. Uh, actually, the idea is that this entity, uh, when it's uh, created, it's always in a proper state from business perspective. And uh, the notion of invariance means that uh, what we just mentioned, we have different uh, business case for each of our entities. Uh, there are some rules and uh, invariance for instance uh, when something is set some other fields also need to be set or if we increase some value of our entity some other uh, property of our entity also should be modified or set in some other state and so on that's because we need to keep track on all these invariants and uh, to put it uh, in such way that uh, cover our business case and uh, always be in a state that uh, correspond to our business logic. That's the main idea that we want to encapsulate all the operations and all the business logic in our entity objects. Here is some illustration of what I have just said. We have some class and we have different invariants. So the invariants you can imagine like a business needs for some state of the internal properties of the project. And uh, our business need is to cover all these uh, valid cases and not to allow some invalid invariant, which technically is possible from but from a business perspective actually has no sense. That's because we try to uh, not give many uh, options of developer or uh, user to uh, put our entity in, in proper state. So one of the things that we need to cover in uh, our application lifecycle dev development is actually complexity. Uh, because um, when we have a bigger code base or application, which is with long term, a long uh, life term, uh, it's very, very complex to uh, keep all these business rules and uh, to avoid bugs and uh, any changes of our code during the development, modification, and uh, further enhancement of the code base can uh, raise additional uh, bugs and uh, time to fix them. And all this stuff uh, is um, very uh, expensive and time consuming. So we try to uh, fight this complexity using our encapsulated model and uh, try to skip options to put it in invalid state as much as possible. So uh, for instance, uh, here, how looks typical anemic model. We have, as I said already, some class, few properties and of uh, another side, we have some service that do some operation of this class, but you see that he has no 
any specific restrictions or uh, he has no protection from duplicate operations logic and uh, anybody can start to uh, prepare some method in this person's service, do some operation and uh, not in any case uh, what is set in our uh, person class it's valid for instance we can have different requirements which are interconnected and not all possible uh, values for initializing this class is uh, good for our business logic actually this uh, anemic domain model is not uh, definitely bad one because uh, there are many cases when we have uh, some simpler application or uh, some uh, not very big code base, not a very intensive business logic. And uh, this approach for develop our domain model is uh, pretty good to start and to use it. Uh, as you see, it is intuitive, easy, uh, it is also easy to implement and uh, development team can uh, consist of development of different skills so it is easy to involve this uh, domain model in uh, your team and everybody can follow it without any troubles and the uh, opposite uh, rigid domain model uh, needs a, uh, somehow different mindset of thinking and it is a bit uh, more time consuming when you start to prepare it. But uh, long term, uh, it is very beneficial because you spend some more time in the very beginning of your application to prepare uh, this type of modeling. And uh, after that, it uh, helps you to uh, prevent different improper use cases regarding the business logic that is set for your application. So uh, we can combine this rich domain model in anemic domain model in our application. So we are not obligatory to use uh, one or the other. Depending on our bounded context, we can use then in some um, combination and uh, Usually, uh, I want to mention here that all this stuff that we talk about now is in context of so-called uh, domain-driven design. That's because uh, actually domain models are closely related to bounded context. Depending on uh, which bounded context, uh, context in our application, uh, we use for one of uh, contexts we can apply a rich domain model for another we can keep it simpler and use an anemic one. Uh, here it is uh, some of the problems that one and the other can solve and uh, help to avoid some uh, duplication, some uh, errors. As I said, both domain models have their advantages and disadvantages. And uh, we can um, think very uh, careful uh, for which part of our application, which one is suitable and not to uh, use only one of them and rely only of one decision. It's depend of complexity, it's depend on uh, the amount of code and depends on um, business rules which need to cover in our application. Uh, the main part and the main actor in our rich domain object actually are these uh, value objects. Value object is something uh, that uh, help us to uh, implement our business logic and business rules in a most, uh, how to say, typ typ typized um, manner, because uh, value objects are very simple classes usually. Their advantages are that they are immutable, their state couldn't be changed after uh, object is created. And usually during the object creation, we have possibility to uh, 
create object only in a proper state. There are different techniques for uh, creating such value objects. What stay behind value objects? Uh, there are simple classes with some, uh, how to say, requirements to implement. Usually when we create uh, value objects, value objects can be very simple. Maybe only one um, property or two properties, which are strings or some other uh, type, but they can consist of uh, many properties and also they can keep inside other value objects. Typical uh, look of one value object, as I said, it is a class which has private constructor and one factory method which actually do some checks when you create these objects for some business rules and after that create instance of this object. The good thing for these objects is that uh, they are uh, from uh, our type system that uh, the framework allows. They are not primitive types. We need to try to avoid primitive types and to try to combine different primitive types as properties in one logical object, which actually uh, keeps the state of the some business part of our application according to the business rules. So uh, here it is some sample application domain. As I said, uh, the author of the course and uh, the articles give us some uh, example how we can use uh, sample application to implement our modeling uh, in a manner of this uh, rich domain model. Usually there are a few classes with some dependencies. As you can see here, for instance, we can have customer with simple properties with getters and setters like email, name, status, and so on. But uh, as we already discussed, there are different business cases and invariants. For instance, for our customer, we uh, don't need to create, for instance, customer which has no uh, name and email set at the same time, for instance. Or we can have some uh, other part of properties which are interconnected. So usually the case when we need to prepare uh, so-called value objects, we need to find in our uh, domain entities dependencies between properties which are uh, interconnected and then need to be set one according to other. And in this case, we can prepare uh, this so-called value object, which are, as I said, small classes, which have one or two properties, even one property, which is of primitive type is also enough. And in this case, when we start to uh, implement our model, we replace, for instance, two or three fields from our uh, domain entity with typed object of uh, some class, which actually is uh, um, our value object and not use simple primitives like strings or like uh, Boolean or like date time, which are typical primitive type of our um, language that we use. And we combine our logical connected properties in one value object, which is already typed object and we can use it. Uh, typical application that is used uh, at the very big, uh, end of the application, uh, I have some reference materials, they are Git repository that uh, keeps all uh, these operations, uh, entities and so on. Uh, you can check the difference between uh, initial version of application and rework one. It is used uh, standard operation like create update and delete and uh, it's rely on this sample model that we already saw.
uh, usually the application structure is as most applications are structured. We have uh, some entities. After that, we have services. As we already discussed, they put some operation and business logic on these entities. We have mappings which are related for our ORM system, and we have repositories which keep the data in our database, actually store the data in our database. And uh, as you see here, the structure of the project is separated based on the different type of uh, object. We have these entities, mappings, repositories, and surfaces, and then are combined in separate folders. Uh, that's the start of our application. And as you can see, for instance, our entities usually required some validation, but uh, this validation can be implemented in different way. Usually validation is applied using some uh, annotation framework. We put some requirement for different properties and uh, typically that cover our business needs, but usually it's not enough because some of the validation uh, are connected to one or other. And usually we have no business logic if we use only fluent validation. Uh, that's because it's a good idea to use validation, but they are uh, not enough to cover our business needs. Uh, here it is some examples for uh, interconnected properties when we have set one property to some value predefined usually from business part we need to uh, modify another one uh, exactly in one particular state so some of these variants are valid some of these variants are not valid from business perspective so we need to uh, make our code as much as possible protected from setting our variants in uh, logic which is not from our business requirements. That's because, uh, as I said, we try to combine primitive properties with primitive type like strings or date time or something else in objects which are actually uh, with some business requirements embedded when they are created. And uh, here it is example again for this that we try to uh, decouple our shape of uh, incoming data and uh, modeling of our domain model. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention about these value objects, here it is uh, some samples for uh, implementation of uh, such type of object. Usually uh, when we define value object, it is of some type and we predefined some basic operations. The basic operations usually are for comparing value objects. They have no identity, they have no some unique width that can compare and set that one value object is equal to other. Usually we compare value object based on uh, overriding method for equals. And uh, for instance, if we have uh, two value object with uh, two properties, street and zip code, and we treat that one object is equal to other object, depending on that comparison, if the street of both objects are one and the same, and if the zip code ends one and the same. We have no other notion for uniqueness or uh, if they are equal. Here is uh, some small examples. For instance, we combine uh, currency and amount fields in something that is named money. It is example for uh, some value object that needs to keep this information in its uh, construction. And uh, actually it keeps both these properties during the whole life cycle of the object. 
As I said, when we create this object, we uh, usually use factory methods. Uh, object is immutable and uh, we need additionally to implement few of uh, internal methods from uh, base value objects, which is uh, get hash code and implicit and explicit conversion, because uh, in this way we can easily transform our value object to a simple primitive type and opposite. So uh, all these uh, basic operations can be implemented in our uh, base value object and we need to override for each of our value objects only comparison methods which depend on the field which are uh, set in our value object and in this way we can uh, define if two copies of value object are uh, identical or not. Good implementation of uh, such value objects has in reference materials. There are different ways to implement a value object. One are more generic, one are not so generic. Each of them has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, here it is uh, what I'm talking about when we have such value objects. Usually, this is factory methods that create instance of our object. In this case, it is create. And <coughs> sorry, you see that before we create our uh, object in this factory method, we can put here different use cases that need to be uh, fulfilled before we create a uh, value object in a proper state. That's the beauty of this because actually we have used the type system of our language in the environment and also we can put some encapsulation of business logic so we don't need to rely on developer to uh, cover all the business needs we uh, left most of the logic uh, encapsulated so. Uh, when start to use this business object it's hard to put it in a in proper state and usually when we try to use after that in some other code of our application such value objects you can see that they can used internally from our getter and setters and when we have a getter for our value object it's simply call create method factory method to expose the uh, instance of value objects and after that when we have setters we can use uh, this implicit and explicit conversion that can uh, help us when we need to uh, transfer value object to some uh, usual type for our type system when we implement these objects uh, they are closely connected usually to ORM that we use because uh, different ORMs have uh, some different types of uh, modeling of uh, different relations. Usually uh, most of the um, value objects are backup from private fields and uh, for different ORMs, we have different opportunities to uh, modify uh, private fields, uh, public properties and collections. So um, there are some tricks when we uh, set up usability of value objects depending on ORM. Is it, uh, for instance, entity framework or it is in hibernate or something else uh, like uh, uh, ORM. But in any case, uh, it is important to uh, check what are possibilities for mapping of our ORM because uh, for some ORMs it is easier to implement this approach for some other ORMs it is a bit complex to follow this but it is possible. Uh, actually as I said already there are many benefits of this uh, building box and uh, the abstraction is the most important one we start to thinking of uh, 
way of uh, business uh, logic and uh, business values, not in uh, some primitive types like strings, decimal, and whatever. And uh, this uh, fully utilization of uh, type system is the most uh, important one then prevent us from do some improper business logic steps. Uh, as I said uh, previously, we can combine uh, the both approaches. What I have in mind when we have some validation, we can use our fluent validation uh, framework and we can have opportunity to use value objects to combine both of them. Uh, what is good for using our attribute validation? When we use attribute validation, usually it is very declarative. This means that you can easily find uh, what is expected of uh, some simple uh, properties and what they should do as a values and uh, as a combination between them. If we combine all this stuff in value objects, this gives us advantages for the typing and not use primitive tips. And uh, if we combine both of them, it is the most powerful option. Usually uh, this idea can be implemented using uh, custom validation attribute. This custom validation attribute can keep actually value objects. And apart from this, it uh, keeps this annotation that give us clear uh, vision what we need actually to achieve with our validation. Apart from this, this gives us opportunity to remove part of our code in controllers because when we put these validation custom attributes over our entities, uh, out of the box system try to implement all the rules which are already set up in our uh, custom validation attributes, but internally custom validation attributes can use value objects. So uh, the business logic encapsulation can be preserved from other side. Our value objects usually uh, have no notion about which name of the field they are applied. So when we combine uh, value objects and uh, annotation attributes for validation, we can easily find in case of any uh, validation uh, errors, which is the field that is not uh, complies with our validation logic. And uh, it is the bot of two words. We have option to uh, use declarative part and the option to use this encapsulation related to our type uh, type system. Uh, what is the, the um, final result from uh, such type uh, of encapsulation of types? Uh, usually we move, start to move all of our business logic in methods of our domain logic. One additional field that we need to think of is uh, about collections, which is always part of our entities. Usually uh, when we have uh, collections, they are of type iList or iCollection or something like this, and they give the end uh, developer or user the possibility to use all the interface of these collections. And uh, that is not always a good idea because sometimes we need to uh, restrict user to a uh, few operation. For instance, add some item to collection or remove some item to collection, or we need to do some pre or after uh, implementation during the, this operation. So the good, uh, the, uh, good idea is to try to make our collection like a read-only list that is uh, actually backup from uh, private fields, but idea actually for our domain uh, model collection is to keep them as small as possible from the 
side of interface methods. Usually, uh, our idea is to give this uh, collections uh, few operation that are reasonable from business part and uh, move all other uh, internal methods of our collection out of the accessibility of end user. So the approach is usually to back up our collection with uh, some private fields, but external interface for them to be uh, read only part for list and all other operations which are modifications, adding, removing, or something else to be implemented with uh, some custom methods. So we restrict uh, actually modification of our collection in a way that is uh, not uh, suitable for business needs of uh, these uh, arrays. Uh, let's go further. Uh, as we talk now, uh, it is not mean that actually we don't need services. We need services, but usually the business logic is not good uh, way to keep them in services. Services are our external interface for uh, things like intercommunication with other system or uh, some API calls or uh, something which is related to external interfaces, but usually services can keep as small uh, business uh, notion as possible. Usually we can keep our services for uh, communication and uh, for some operations that are not related to business logic, but typically, uh, all our business cases and variants and so on need to be moved as a part of uh, each one of the entities of our domain model. So uh, in uh, such way, we uh, step by step try to move all the services for each of our entities into entities uh, building blocks entities methods, entities values object. And uh, at one point after refactoring our application, we see that in our services, we have a very small uh, amount of uh, methods which are related to uh, everything uh, that is uh, not uh, related to our business logic, but actually the business uh, rules and uh, everything which need to keep our model in a proper state is not part anymore of the service methods and uh, service interfaces. And uh, usually uh, in the very beginning when we start, we have a typical uh, structure of the project where we have all these uh, business object grouped by uh, their meaning, but actually we need to keep in a bit uh, other structure, not grouped by entities, mappings, repositories. The better idea is uh, to group uh, in a logical way. What I have in mind is that, for instance, uh, when we group objects, we need to group them by uh, logical meaning. For instance, we have folder customers, and in these folder customers, we have different type. For instance, we have mapping, we have repositories, we have different value object. Everything related to customer actually is in this folder. It is not related only to entities DTOs, it's related to repository, it's related to every operation which uh, keep track for our uh, object. So that is useful when we have big code base and we need to navigate and to find all the operations which we need for our uh, different objects in a such structure of uh, our project. And it is uh, in long term very uh, very useful to follow and to find uh, what we uh, need and to how we operate over our entities. Apart from this, we have a few options to improve uh, 
our web API and uh, different responsibilities of uh, our uh, entities using uh, different approaches. What you have in mind is, for instance, put some of the logic outside of controller in our uh, base controllers. When we using uh, some unit of works, usually uh, committing the operation is not need to be part of any of the unit of works of different types. We can put this operation in our uh, base controller. So at the end of the operation, when operation succeed successful, we can commit the transaction or if the operation commit with some errors, out of the box, this transaction is discarded. So we don't need to uh, try to remember and to uh, call this uh, stuff in our controllers. So try to keep our controllers as simple as possible and uh, put all the operations that we need outside of the implementation of uh, method of controllers. Uh, let's see what is left. Uh, here it is what I am talking about from the very beginning. Most of the things that we discussed till now are part of the courses and articles and uh, repositories uh, which are from uh, the author Vladimir Korikov. Uh, usually functional uh, C-sharp is uh, very interesting also functional programming is uh, some method that is particularly very interesting for me and most of the things that are uh, showed here are related to different type of uh, responses and capsulation of uh, responses uh, and uh, different uh, success and failed methods most of these things are uh, part of the articles for this author. So if you're interested in uh, some details of implementation or uh, some sample code, you can find it here. And uh, I think that's most of the things that I wanted to share with you. If you have some questions that raise in your heads and I can give some answers, now is the moment so that was from my side moment uh thank you so much for this presentation we have uh one question in our chat can you check it or i can read uh, let me try to find it uh, well, as i see the question is uh let me check it. Uh, should entities lie in the main project with repositories? Uh, usually, as I said, uh, our uh, entities is good to be separated on the business logic level. Uh, for instance, they should be kept. If we have employee in this employee, you uh, can keep all the entities for this employee also repository objects which correspond for this employee. Uh, mappings related to set uh, or mappings for the fields which are for our entity corresponding to employee. And uh, all this stuff, uh, all the uh, domain uh, model for employee, including uh, mapping for this model, including uh, mm, this uh, uh, repository methods, everything can be kept in uh, this uh, abstraction named, uh, for instance, employee. It is easier when the code base is uh, big, so we can easily find the database operations, uh, definitions, uh, validation, everything related to uh, this uh, object in one place and it is easier to focus on them and find what transformed this object, how it's mapped to our database tables, everything related to it. It's a good practice to be situated on one place. I hope that uh, this to some extent answered the question. Okay. Here's some other comments. 
if something else left. Any other questions? As I said, it is only a sense of all these findings from the original author. Everything, if you have interested, can find in uh, his articles and uh, online courses. I don't pretend to be very exhaustive on all this stuff, but I share with you because it was, at least for me, very interesting. And uh, further, every one of you can go and dig deeper to find the implementation details for each of these topics.